Hi, investigators. Mike Evans again with the weekly roundup of the news in private investigations in Australia. Now, after last week's debacle, there's going to be no more mucking around this week. And we're going to start off seriously with industry associations. The AIPI have come out this week and they're doing a survey into the education requirements of the um, uh, Ombudsman and the Information Commissioner and all the integrity agencies in Victoria. So the AIPI has sent out to their members a little survey to help them put together um, some uh, recommendations for that. Here's a quick sneak peek at the survey. So they're asking a whole lot of questions like, what's your name? Uh, what's your knowledge of the Victorian in, um, integrity agencies? Well, I can put in my name, that's fine. I have good knowledge of them. Uh, yes, can you please specify any agencies you have knowledge of, etc.? And it asks you all these questions about them. Now, unfortunately, I do the training for the, for the government investigation. So I would have to put, no, sorry, I can't answer that. I've signed a confidentiality agreement. So sorry, AIP, I can't help you out on that one with the Investigation Industry Association this week. I'm sworn to secrecy over what we teach them and how we go about it. Now, this week in the news around Australia, there's been some... Um, government investigation issues with dumping for local governments. So both of them have resulted in investigations. Here's the first one. In Tumbolgan in New South Wales, someone's dumped a whole heap of asbestos down there. Now, they've dumped it in a gully that feeds into a water supply and basically it's taken the fire brigade in New South Wales two days in hazmat suits to clean it up. Now, this is only recently. It's just this week. The local government in that area is going to be looking to see who's dumping that waste, who's had recently renovations approved, where that waste could have come from. They're going to be checking to see who did it. Now, that's happened recently in New South Wales, so something to keep an eye on. And the people that will be doing the investigation hold a certificate for in government investigations. Now, similarly, down in Tasmania, there's been a dumping problem as well. Now, down there, um, Stephen has been fined $3,500 for dumping old tyres at Nugent in Tasmania, which is down near Sorrell. Now, um, he's driven up there. A council officer's followed him. He's seen him dump the tyres. And Stephen's gone to court. He's represented himself and said, well, you know, it's too much to take him to the tip at the time, uh, yada, yada. And the magistrate said, yeah, look, I agree, it's too much. But I'm going to find you $3,500 for dumping those tyres in um, in the bush in Sorrell. So Stephen um, is going to have to pay that, I guess, over time. But he was caught doing it by a local laws officer of the Sorrell District Council down in southeast Tasmania. Now... Um, I've got a bit of a connection with this one because um, <laughs> I used to play football against Stephen's brother. Yeah, Stephen's brother, he used to play for the Sharks. Now, he wasn't nicknamed Boulder because he was tall and skinny. He was nicknamed Boulder because, well, he hit very hard and he was a 
very hard opponent. I played for the um, Kangaroos at Tribuna and Boulder played for the Sharks. Every game, he was awesome. He'd hit you at 100 miles an hour, knock you flying. Never saw him get in a fight. He was a really fair footballer, um, really great bloke. He was laughing the whole game, but my word, he was a task and a half to keep up with and try and nullify. Be a very good football player, very hard. Never saw him hit anyone in country football. He was very fair play because he realised, I think, he knew if he hit someone, he'd kill him. So a, a great um, footballer, um, Boulder was, Stephen's brother, um, and um, yeah, brought back some happy memories for me from 35 years ago. Now, speaking of football, it's come out today that Sean Smith, a footballer from the AFL in Melbourne, has won a damages payout of 1.4 million from MLLC for his life insurance. Now, he took that policy out 25 years ago when he was playing football, um, according to the Herald Sun, and now he requires long-term treatment, including daily medication and um, for his head injury um, and his concussion. And his symptoms have been uh, depression, pervasive suicidal ideation, feelings of helplessness, social withdrawal, insomnia, and poor short-term memory. Now, this has implications for all the private investigators out there. This was paid out on Sean's own life insurance policy. Now, it wasn't workers' compensation that was covered for his um, employment as a professional footballer that paid out. So it was life insurance. Now, other footballers out there will have that professional footballers and country footballers and ladies and men who play football and rugby players and netballers and hockey players will have all these boxes. They'll have this too. So this, um, the Herald Sun is claiming in one article, could be a bit of a precedent for a test case to open up the floodgates for such claims. Now, if you're going to have claims for this sort of thing, the investigators are going to be investigating it and they're going to be going through your history. Um, now, with Sean, they have... Uh, television programs that they can look back over and see the hits. They're on, they're on YouTube. You can see how he's carried off the ground, that sort of thing. And um, he, he's received what seems to be an alarmingly large payout, but he's only 51 years old. And he has suffered all those things. So he's got to have um, constant care and medication. He's got to pay his legal bills out of that too. So whether this does open up... Um, the floodgates in the future? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that it will uh, or whether it will affect workers' compensation of players. Um, Muhammad Ali, he had Parkinson's disease. They reckon that was a result of all the knocks to the head. So you just don't know where these things may go. So in that's in the news this week from um, football, um, professional football, and um, I wish Sean Smith all the best in the future. I um, hope he um, has some kind of recovery. That, that's an awful thing. Um, other news this week, we have um, in Tasmania, hang on, where's my Tasmania? Oh, I better bring it up. I'm sick for Tasmania, just watching that. Yeehaw! Now, in Tasmania, a gentleman who um, claims, his family claims, he's now deceased, um, was stung by a bee in his work. And the coronial inquest is trying to find out whether the deceased, Wally Briars, was an employee or if he was a um, contractor. So this is going to be an issue because he was working for the um, Honey um, Workplace and his job on the day that he um, became deceased was he was delivering beehives. Now, he got stung by a bee and he died from anaphylactic shock in January 1998 and that's what when he was delivering those hives. So the issue has come down for... Um, the coronial inquiry to decide whether he was an employee or whether he was um, just an independent worker or a contractor to the company. Now, his son claims that he did, you know, lawn mowing and deliveries and stuff like that, and he was always paid cash. So 
because he never owned a credit card or he never used an ATM card in his life. He was a cash payments man. So that's what um, the family is saying about the deceased and that he deserves workers' compensation for dying um, as a result of an injury attained at work, which is um, fair enough. So the case law that's going to be looked at when they argue this case and the colonial court will be looking at and presented to them by an investigator or a loss adjuster or whoever the first one will be stevens versus broad group live i'm always live and i can't say broad group sawmilling and co proprietary limited why couldn't he have called himself smith that would have been easier so that's the first case law they will look at into in deciding what's the case law that says a person's a, a employee or a contractor um, what 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 are the issues around that? So that's one that they'll look at. And the other one that they'll probably look at too is Hollis versus Babu. And this is a case in uh, Sydney, this one, where uh, there was a cyclist injured in their workplace. And they're going to have to make a decision on whether the deceased in this case was um, an employee and entitled to a workers' compensation payout for his death at work uh, to his family and his independence. So... It's, it's going to be a big decision. We'll watch that with some interest and I'll keep you updated on, on what the outcome of that one is. So, that again, that's down in Tasmania, full of interest down there this week, apart from my old footy days. So, <laughs> so um, if you've ever been to a coronial inquest, they're very casual um, and um, it's never a, a, an event that uh, you look forward to going to because it's always someone that died. But um, great little court down there, the coroner's court in um, Hobart. I've given evidence here several times. Okay, I promised that I would have for you this week surveillance operative. Let's have a look at what she's got to say. Hello, my name's Jenny. I'm a rural surveillance specialist. In other words, I work in the country. I operate across an area of approximately 1,500 kilometres. I mostly conduct investigations for workers' compensation. This includes identifying subjects, confirming their addresses and establishing and recording their physical activities. I basically collect video evidence. I then make notes. I write reports before sending in a DVD to the clients. I also conduct covert product purchases and occasionally I serve court documents. This type of work includes swearing affidavits after the assignment is complete. Why do I love my job? Well, I love my job because I have a great sense of freedom. I'm exposed to many different environments from the seaside to the desert's edge. I'm really privileged to see many different things in my travels from native wildlife to the changes of the seasons. This is me in my ghillie suit. Bush surveillance in this manner can be both adrenaline pumping and some of the time really scary. After a little while, you become more confident, but it's really, really important that you keep yourself safe and you remain wary. Blending in is a fine art, and as you can see, at times the wildlife cannot even detect me. Being a private investigator is awesome. No two days are ever the same, and every day is a new challenge. I can find myself following subjects to the football, the soccer, horse racing, boxing matches, local markets, and occasionally long weekends away in beautiful places. I have um, frequently ironic days, which I find entertaining. You can do 30 long hours with no sighting and then stumble onto your subject the very next day while you're doing your own shopping. Or you can lose a subject in really bad traffic conditions and then find them 30 minutes later right after you've stopped frantically searching for them. And an investigation for me starts with research and planning. The most satisfaction you can achieve from each job is knowing that your research and plan have assisted you in achieving the required results. On occasion, I will conduct residential surveillance. This for me is very different from my mainstream work and for the life of me, I still can't work out why I'm not as successful with my blending in techniques. It's probably better I stay in the country where I don't stand out so much. Anyway, I hope you all enjoy some of the real life photos and the videos taken while I'm on real life files. And I do hope to meet you at the Australian Security Academy courses. If you're considering becoming an investigator, my advice to you would be don't be scared. Don't be intimidated. Jump in head first and go for it. I did and I've never looked back. Hope to see you soon. Bye. 
Thanks for the insight, Jen. That was really great. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, um, what, what type of investigations will I do as an investigator? I told you about the dumping of asbestos in Tom Bolgan. Uh, Tom Bolgan, sorry. <laughs> Tom Bolgan's a great little place to do an investigation. I've actually done one there. And just like last week where I'm um, in Gladstone, you buy your milk and bread from the shop frozen because it's so isolated in the Australian country. Tom Bolgan's just about 20 k's lower than the Gold Coast on the map but it's a little country town and to get into the local shop there you have to step over the labrador dog that's asleep in the doorway <laughs> great place to do an investigation and my investigation there i learned a really i learned a really amazing thing um, most witnesses that you interview they're very matter of fact they have nothing to hide they're very helpful but the, the one thing i i just learned was the insightfulness of witnesses that day that I interviewed the young lady. And it was about a young man. Um, he was only 19 years of age. He went to a party. Um, he drove a friend home and driving back to the party, unfortunately had an accident and he died. And I was interviewing her about being at the party and, and seeing him before he left. And I was taking a statement and I said, Did, do you know if he had anything to drink? She said, I, I only saw him have one stubby of Carlton Cold. And I said, okay, all right, but do you, did you see him have anything else? She said, no. I said, well, was he intoxicated? She said, no. She was absolutely definite about it. And I said, well, how do you know he wasn't intoxicated? She just sort of looked down. She wasn't hiding anything. And she said, I know when he's drunk, because when he was drunk, he always told me he loved me. Well, that was her knowledge of him and the fact that he wasn't drunk. And that was extremely helpful in the case in his CTP liability matter. Now, we get all kinds of investigations. Some are interesting, some are run of the mill. I'm going to show you three now. <laughs> One's a heavy metal one and the guy in the first one. Oh, man, I have never interviewed a person like this. This guy, <laughs> he had an accident. He climbed up an internal steel ladder that's built into the wall with one arm he climbed 35 meters out of where he was up with one arm and um got in a boom and lowered himself down and called an ambulance for help it was amazing to hear his story this guy you wouldn't want to play football against him but he was a really really tough and then there's two investigations after that that are a little bit different have a look at it the electrician i was interviewing was working at the bottom of a large chimney stack down inside it with a angle grinder and he sliced off his left forearm. He explained to me how he put um, his shirt around that to stop the bleeding and he stuck his arm in his belt and he climbed up the internal ladder to the top of the chimney stack which was around about 35 metres high and he got out, lowered himself down in the boom and called an ambulance for help. He explained that he was feeling a little bit faint but they have since fixed his um, arm and he's a lot better today it was actually sewn back on then they had the interview a week later where a man who was delivering a cake fell over and landed on his bottom as he was walking down the footpath to deliver the cake now the cake was intact but the lady who is delivering the cake to laughed at him falling over so he got a psychological injury as a result of being laughed at and was unable to ever go back to work again. He didn't follow Wayne Wang's step-by-step -step guide about cake delivery, which you can Google on the internet. And it tells you all about how to safely deliver a cake. I think Wayne should change his name to Trevor or David. It'd probably be a little bit more helpful for his credibility. So there's all different types of investigations that we face. The HR department of a Victorian public service department decided it'd be a great idea to send their staff along to drumming for team building. On the surface, that sounds really cool. <laughs> but actually, it was just... And as a consequence, one of the staff ended up with a bad back injury and put in a workers' compensation claim. Now, it's a very important reminder to us all who are going to...
drumming, team building, training, that we should know how to lift correctly. And that should be part of the induction in every drumming session conducted by the Victorian Public Service for team building in the public service when they've got too much money and uh, nothing else to spend it on. Okay, to avoid back injury when you're at your drumming workshop with the Victorian Public Service, lift your drum keeping a straight back with two hands. Then you get your drum beater with your right hand after resting it firmly on your chest and beat it like that. Do not dance around indiscriminately twisting your back. That could lead to back injury. So be very careful at drumming workshops when you're there on behalf of the Victorian Public Service. It's a dangerous place. In our next session, we're going to be looking at safety issues around Korean line dancing, just in case the HR manager of your Victorian government department decides to send your team along to that for team building. See you in the next session. I'm Mike Evans from the Australian Security Academy. Well, that last one, so the government department decides that they're going to go along to the training session for team building. Now, when you do this in the public service, you've got to take into account the people that are in your department. Now, I don't know, but if you force them to do something that's, you know, beyond their values or their beliefs, that sort of thing, um, if Ted in accounts is a committed Satanist, he doesn't want to go along to healing drumming. <laughs> he wants to be total upheaval and chaos all the time. So if you force Ted <laughs> along to drumming, he's going to bugger it up and he's going to sabotage it. And he may even say, oh, look, as a result of that, I've got a back injury from lifting my very heavy um, medicine drum. <laughs> and I guess if that could happen. I don't know. I didn't investigate that one. But you do not know what you're going to get. One week it will be a fatal accident that you'll be investigating. Another week it could be something as simple as a slip, trip and fall for someone who's delivering a cake. So be aware of that. Now, the other thing that's been happening this week, um, you've, uh, if you've been watching this program, uh, you've been uh, seeing that um, one insurance company and possibly another, a second one, have demanded that uh, investigators who are licensed and on their panel join an industry association. Now, there's been a bun fight over that and the world's experts have weighed in on it and everybody hates each other and drama, drama, drama. Um, but basically, they've said that. And as of noon yesterday, Thursday, you either are in an industry association or you weren't working for them on their panel. And it's as simple as that. So people complied. Uh, a few people didn't comply. Uh, whatever. Who cares? That's what happened. Now, phase three of that program with that insurer who's only doing this to comply with the Hain inquiry from last year. Okay, all insurance um, insurers have got to comply with that. And this one said, well, the way we're complying is we're going to be doing general insurance code of um, practice training. They've already done that. That was one. We're going to ensure that our investigators are a member of an industry association. That was two. And three, they're going to have to do internal training. Now, what sort of internal training are they going to have to do? Well, basically, they want you to understand their insurance um, uh, company guidelines. So you're going to have training in that. And at the Australian Security Academy, we're doing this for several organisations. They're going to want you to understand privacy and document handling and storage. That's, that's a big demand that they want. And that's as a result of their past experiences where something went wrong. They're going to want you to be totally familiar with vulnerable persons and identifying financial hardship and dealing with customers with a declared mental illness. Now, they want that. So the Australian Security Academy, we train in that. 
They also want you to uh, undertake workers' compensation and CTP liability training. Today, here in this show, we looked at a workers' compensation matter and we looked at the case law that relates to it. You don't dictate that case law, but you should be aware of it. So you have an understanding of that for workers' compensation investigations. You don't learn that in any other RTO. You only learn that at the Australian Security Academy in relation to workers' compensation, because that's what we teach. You're also are going to have to have an understanding with uh, these insurers of CTP liability and surveillance practices. Now, what does that mean? It means when you do CTP liability uh, and you do your course, you're going to have to know the question to ask an ambulance officer and the questions to ask whoever else. So there's going to be a whole list of questions. So let's firstly, we'll go to the ambulance officer. When you go and interview an ambulance officer, I think there's 42 potential questions that you ask them. So let's have a look at that. Forty-four questions. So there they are. Now you just learnt something that you can show with the insurance company. I know what questions to ask an ambulance officer. Well, you do. There's forty-four questions there. But before that ambulance officer replies to any single one of them, there are going to be three potential in que uh, questions for each one you ask them to get further detail. And this is what we teach our students at the Australian Security Academy how to do that. So. You know, given that there are 44 questions before you ask another one to clarify with ambulance officers, there's 110 questions you ask the tow truck driver. Now, this is CTP liability, so that's 110 questions that you're going to ask them before they give you a single response. So that will put you up around about 300 questions you're going to be asking uh, an ambulance driver about the accident. Now, the witnesses, when you speak to them, um, there's probably going to be 220 questions <laughs> that you're going to ask a witness who saw the accident happen. They were there at the time. So, you know, when you add this up and you look at the questions that you're going to ask the insured owner of the vehicle that had the accident or the CTP, like, they are, they're all there. So there's uh, basically 429 of them before you even ask a question to clarify, which will multiply that by three times and give you a two and a half hour interview. So that's a lot of questions. So here all together, just for CTP liability, you're going to be learning 803 questions to ask the insured, the ambulance driver, the witnesses, the tow truck driver, and I haven't even mentioned conducting neighbourhood inquiries and a door knock, nor the police who attended, nor the fire brigade. So it's a pretty big deal. They want you to know. Now, how would you know that and learn all that on top of everything? Member and association. This, the good news, people, is all that is in the Australian Security Academy CPP 30619 Certificate 3 in Investigative Services. It has to be. It says that in the performance criteria of the units in relation to it, CTP liability, workers' compensation, it's throughout it. Now, the Australian Security Academy complies with that and we teach that. So when the insurance company comes to you and says, if you had training in CTP liability or workers' compensation or our um, general guidelines or our code of conduct, you can say, yes, I have, because I held my qualification from the Australian Security Academy. It wasn't an ex-cop with no idea that taught me. I learnt from the professionals. So you're off to a good start making the decision to study at the Australian Security Academy. It's been a really busy week at the Australian Security Academy. There's been a lot going on all around the country. And I've enjoyed the week. It's been great. Got to say happy birthday to Paul York for being 40 this week. Uh, Mario Veeks, happy birthday to you for having um, a birthday this week too as well, mate. So um, that's all from me today. I'm going to... I'm going to play the boost scoop thing again, but I've got to play my Koreans because we had Korean line dancing before and these guys have got to tell us that mission is complete. Last week, they blocked me on YouTube for playing ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> and I've been blocked on um, Facebook for playing stuff too, but I don't think they're ever going to block me for playing country music. See you next week, people. We're going out with our line dancers. Hope you enjoy Chill Out's Friday. Have some fun. Oh, creepy little woman, get along. Get on your way with a heave and a hole. And I just couldn't let her go. I'm Mike Evans from the Australian Security Academy, and that was a new improved Serious Friday afternoon Australian investigation news.